Morena, kia ora tatou. It is good to see you all. It is good to uh, be here today and to arrive at this point. I know there's, there's been a lot of planning uh, that's gone into this day and fabulous that you're all here. It gives me much uh, pleasure to uh, welcome our Mayor uh, who worship Leanne Darzell, uh, the Honourable Leanne Darzell with her vast political experience uh, in the Parliament in Wellington. You can see today, uh, just before I invite Leanne to come forward, that uh, the uh, schedule's quite tight, even down to two minutes in some cases, so there won't be time to tell Australian Prime Minister jokes or anything like that for Richard's benefit. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Leanne to please come forward. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, may I also welcome uh, my mural colleagues, uh, Calvin Coe from Selwyn District Council and David Ayers uh, from the Waimakariri District Council. It's always great to have them uh, across the border uh, into the into the, the Christchurch uh, Rohi and, um, and to uh, welcome them here to this morning. I see councillors Andrew Turner and uh, Jimmy Chen here. I know that Jimmy Chen's going to have to leave with me because we have a a bridge opening. Zero. Oh no, no, that you're not. You're not. It's not in your ward this time. Um, there's so many different openings that are going on and our things. And I just noticed. Um, and I'm. It's a terrible thing to do. Sarah, Sarah from um, Selwyn District Council as well. Really good to have you here. Um, and see, it's always a high risk when you do that. And I saw Mike Davidson, the chair of the um, uh, Shirley Papanui Community Board, as well. Um, can I also thank Councillor Livingston for uh, what would have to be the uh, briefest introduction on history, but I did notice that he had two minutes on the page, so um, <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. And can I thank um, Liz Chesterman for a wonderful welcome on behalf of uh, the Cancer Society Canterbury West Coast Division. Uh, I think that uh, her welcoming us here today is really part of the um, partnership as pathways to success um, that we are here to discuss today. Um, I'm delighted that Christchurch is the host for this uh, Canterbury West Coast Smoke Free Seminar, given that it is the first of its kind. Uh, maintaining support for smoke free community spaces despite the earthquakes uh, could have been a real challenge, especially when we see the pressures placed on council staff uh, post uh, earthquake. But even before I became the Mayor, it was clear that this council would prioritise the smoke-free goal, seizing the opportunity to designate more smoke-free environments. Last year, as the largest landlord after Housing New Zealand, refurbished a new social housing, um, uh, social housing were designated by the council as smoke-free. All new tenancy, tenancies now require residents to be smoke-free at all times in their units. Sensitive to the issues of addiction, this policy has been developed in conjunction with CPH, who have provided advice on supporting tenants wishing to quit smoking. The Council's support for Smoke Free was recognised with an award at the first Health and All Policies Conference held in Christchurch in May this year. Prior to the long-term plan hearings this year, we also voted to introduce smoke-free bus shelters as well as a policy to restrain smoking by staff around our buildings from January this year. I have to admit that when the government announced the goal of a smoke-free New Zealand by 2025, I believed that it was more than ambitious. Could New Zealand really be smoke-free by 2025? But the answer to that question must depend on whether we believe that we can do it take the right steps, form the right partnerships and offer the right support to becoming smoke free. The truth is, if we don't set ambitious goals, we will never achieve them. I became aware of this in our post-disaster environment here in Christchurch when I was introduced to the concept of a stretch target. I hadn't heard of a stretch target before then. It's called a stretch target because it would be a stretch to achieve it. But a stretch target motivates action in a way that a business as usual target does not. A compelling story can push people to think outside the square, and more importantly, to act. But it's important to remember that this is not a goal that either central government or local government can achieve alone. My husband has a neat expression which I like to repeat. Red lights don't stop trains. 
the driver needs to apply the brakes. Legislation is a red light. We need those in the driver's seat to hit the brakes. The idea of working in partnership with populations of smokers in order to achieve the goal is the only way to go. Central government, local government, DHBs, public health units, NGOs and smokers have got to be in it together. At the Local Government New Zealand Conference this year, the Palmerston North City Council was the driving force behind a remit that asked LGNZ to request the government to develop and implement legislation to prohibit smoking outside cafes, restaurants and bars. Our council backed the remit. So often we are asked to introduce bylaws when in fact if we are to achieve our 2025 goal for New Zealand, we need our government to take the lead for us all. All around the world, the denormalisation of what is an acceptable smoking environment is occurring. First it was restaurants, then workplaces. Now it's moving to parks, bus stops and entrances to public buildings. But it's when smokers go outside for a smoke when they're at home that you start to see a real shift in behaviour. Introducing smoke-free prisons and long-stay hospitals, including the grounds, has helped many to quit altogether. Requiring our social housing units to be smoke-free will reinforce the same message. It is important to remember, though, that smokers don't all actually want to feel like pariahs. Many would quit if they thought they could. It is a powerful addiction. Providing them with spaces where they can smoke can be a good start. Some said casinos would go out of business if people had to leave the machines to go to an external smoking area. What about the long haul flights from Asia? Remember how it was said it wasn't possible to have smoke free flights from Asia? Step by step, we can get to 2025. But where you can smoke, albeit important, is only a part of the story. The cost of cigarettes has risen exponentially and every time it increases, more people quit. It, if there is a single proven correla correlation, that is it. Price up, smoking down. But price wasn't my driver. This is the point where I need to confess to being a former smoker. It has been 10 years since I last smoked a cigarette. I wanted to share my story with you because I believe it has something to offer that simply regulating smoke-free environments does not. I taught myself to smoke when I was 14 years old. Neither of my parents smoked, so theoretically I shouldn't have started. Reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point, I can accept his theory that my childhood memories of smoking as a sophisticated behaviour of a beloved great aunt and a fascinating cigarette rolling ritual of a wonderful elderly neighbour are the kinds of memories that override parental exhortation not to smoke. I began smoking seriously once I left home, still in my teens. My early 20s saw me try to give up for the first time. The seesaw effect, on again, off again, continued until I was in my late 20s and I thought I'd cracked it. Three years I gave up for, and then I was elected to Parliament, and within 12 months I was smoking again. The seesaw, on again, off again, continued. Until finally, in my mid-40s, I took myself in hand and decided that I had to define the problem if I was going to be able to address it. And I'd learnt this lesson when I was Minister of Commerce. Please start with defining the problem before you try to solve it. Um, it's always a good thing to do. My problem wasn't giving up smoking. I'd given up smoking heaps of times. My problem was I kept starting again. So I decided to identify why I started again and address that. Two reasons, or really excuses, came to the fore. Weight and stress. I would give up smoking and put on weight and I would use stress as a reason why I needed a cigarette. I also realised that I didn't actually want to give up smoking. Giving up is something that you do 
when you really want to do it. It refers to something you really want to do. I was brought up in the Catholic faith. We gave up things for Lent. We gave up things we loved. So giving up wasn't the answer for me. I decided not to give up ever again. I decided to quit smoking forever. So I lost weight, instead, I, inst instead of going on a diet, instead of changing my diet, I went on a diet, but that's another story which I've had to address in pretty much the same way. But I deliberately lost more weight than I needed to, to feel comfortable in myself, so that I could actually put on a few kilos without feeling bad about myself. Then I waited for a really stressful time, so I would never have to use stress again as an excuse or couldn't use stress again as an excuse for starting again um, and so I chose the 2005 general election that's why I know it was 10 years this year since I quit and then I used a dose of the flu as the kickstarter someone had told me once that the physical addiction only lasts three days so if I could go without smoking for three days I dealt with the physical addiction the rest was all in my mind so um, time in bed not wanting a cigarette, great way to start quitting, and I have never started again. I tell my story to people because I rarely meet a smoker who wants to keep smoking, which is why I believe we can achieve our goal of a smoke-free Aotearoa by 2025. I've always believed that partnerships are pathways to success. We can always achieve more together than we can alone. So thank you for what you are doing to achieve this worthy goal, and I wish you well today. Kia ora koutou katoa.